Hey guys, Man here with another video for you guys. This one's another Aegis video and it's a very special one. This one is on the Hammerhead. As you guys know that I've been going through the Aegis ships by size, I'll be doing this with every ship manufacturer in the game. So, the Aegis Hammerhead is a very, very unique vehicle. It is the only one of its kind that can provide such area denial for the cost of um, manpower and resources. It's a pretty deadly ship. Um, so yeah, the Hammerhead uh, was presented by the Militia Mobilization Initiative, same as the RSI Polaris, and a handful of other military craft. It's all about the UEE trying to get people to defend themselves. And that can only mean one thing. Well, one, that the UEE is slowly but surely receding in terms of money, like funding and manpower, and that the existential threats are growing. So, good news for every single one of you uh, wannabe space heroes, last starfighter Jedi types. So, let's continue here with uh, all the details on the Hammerhead. And, uh, yeah, let's learn up about its lore, its capabilities, and then do a little, mix in a little bit of theory craft in there at the end. How does that sound? Alright, so let's do this. Enlist today. The Militia Mobilization Initiative needs heroes to do their part in making the Empire more secure. In these dangerous times, a strong sense of community is more important than ever. The UEE is working with local militias to empower civilians and citizens like yourself to help provide an additional security presence in supporting of local law enforcement. With the ongoing military operations to reclaim Vanduul space and a rising tide of criminal activity, the Empire needs you more than ever to help take a stand for justice and safety for every family. Right, so let's start with this Q&A here. The Impartial Guide to the Ships of the Known Universe, Whitley's Guide, Rigors Testing, Historical Information, and Statistical Analysis. Modern space and naval warfare owes a lot of its doctrine to the United Empire of Earth's aggressive military expansion of the 20th century. In the wake of the two Tavaran Wars, the UEE military's official role was to keep the peace during the colonial expansion programs as a last resort tool for overwhelming force projection. But they were also suppressing any dissent in the public. The UEE used the threat of all-out war with the giant empire to focus on technological development and modernization projects intended to prepare for open warfare with an equal or, as most tacticians privately believe, superior foe. A major part of this effort meant defining a more complex order of battle. Where a single carrier or destroyer squadron would have once operated with impunity, they now look to diversify their supply trains, command and control, and immediate defense away from the single combat element. It is the latter need that would give rise to the Hammerhead. In March 2765, High Command issued a request for Proposal RFP seeking a dedicated anti-fighter platform that could serve as both a key element of the standard fleet screen and as a cost-effective patrol ship to replace the aging Jean class, itself a converted coiler design hastily adapted for the newly needed role of fleet defense. Aegis Dynamics was tasked with developing this new warship then identified as Project Minotaur, and began a ground-up development that November. Structural development lasted 18 months, followed by three years of construction on the first six testbed articles. The initial prototypes, numbered MJX-1 through 6, suffer from the type of teething issues not uncommon for initial purpose-built spacecraft designs. The MJX-1 was retired early due to quantum drive issues, which required a major conceptual overhaul. The MJX-2 suffered significant issues with her shield generators, and the MJX-4 was lost with all hands during a test flight trial. A review board would officially classify the incident as crew error. The MJX-5 and 6 were both converted to full-scale articles and delivered to the Navy, though both were assigned to reserve units and did not see action, and were scrapped as the flight IIA models began to come online in 2854. The MGX-3 survives to this day and is currently stored at one of Aegis archive facilities in anticipation of an impending restoration for a museum. These failures aside, the result of the prototype program was a highly successful new spacecraft design. Aegis had built a fast warship nimble enough to properly support a battle group's baffles, while remaining inexpensive enough to be constructed in large numbers. The Hammerhead's key components and remains is turrets, 
The ship's normative silhouette derived from the need to allow maximum possible coverage for anti-fighter weaponry, giving it the ability to fill the field with laser fire during mass fleet engagements. In the century and a half since the Hammerhead's inception, the design has undergone four major overhauls and continued to stay in service even after the fall of the Messers. Countless variants were even produced, customized for a variety of purposes. The Flight 2 model, which replaced a radar emplacement with an additional turret and redesigned the internal deck layout in response to a readiness report from gun crews operating in the field, 2817. The first wave of Flight 2 were found to have a blind spot, which was corrected with the Flight IIA model. Flight 3 models, which focus on overall upgrade to modern command and control surfaces, replaced all extant earlier ships by 2915. The Flight 4 is the modern version and adding multiple additional remote turrets and tools for increased modularity. At press time, 85% of the Navy's infantry operates these types, with the Flight 3 examples largely retired to reserve and homeland defense units. Service History The first production model ship, the UEES Hammerhead, PCG-3748, was transferred to the United Empire of the Earth's Navy on August the 9th. 2773, in a commissioning ceremony at MacArthur in the Killian system. After six months of space trials proved uneventful, an additional five hulls were approved. The UES Dragonet, the Garibaldi, the Tigerfish, Vindale, and Knifefish, and allocated to the 5th Fleet to serve as proof of concept for newly developed carrier warfare doctrine. The escort ships were dispatched from the combat screen for a heavy carrier and spent the next two years running extensive training exercises aimed at perfecting battlegroup formations. A variety of bomber units, destroyer and cruiser squadrons served as aggressors, putting both the new ships through simulated combat trials while improving the fleet's overall understanding of spatial warfare tactics. As a result, the Hammerhead became fairly well known among up-and-coming officers assigned to this work. The general opinion was positive, with officers impressed with both the ship's combat efficiency and overall survivability. These same hammerheads drew the class First Blood the next year when the Vandal Raiding Squadron encountered a skirmisher group. Though the firefight was minor, the results were clear. Eight Vandal ships were repulsed, without ever entering visual range of the battle group's flagship. Six sides were shot down, two forced to escape the UES Tigerfish scoring an impressive three air-to-air -air kills. Tigerfish would go on to destroy an outlaw raider and her escorts later that year, becoming the first ace hammerhead crew. The intelligence community remains divided as to whether the Vandal ships were simply in the wrong place at the wrong time or if they had been shadowing the larger naval assets regularly and were now running afoul of the new navy. Pleased with the Hammerhead's proven combat capability and its new role in fleet operations, the Empire doubled their initial hull order with Aegis, and six months later signed an additional expansion that requested permanent production. Correctly sensing that they had a long-term success on their hands, Aegis invested heavily in factory and infrastructure to expand their Hammerhead lines. By 2779, five factories and three systems were turning out Hammerheads with the Navy purchasing as quickly as possible to outfit the growing number of equipped battle groups being made ready for war. By the middle of the next decade, the design would completely replace its predecessor, and the T-shaped design would become permanently associated with fleet defense. The company also greatly expanded their supply chain for the ships, creating a thriving third-party part market that continues to positively impact the Hammerhead maintenance today. The first active duty hammerhead loss occurred in 2782 when the UES Gilberti PCG 3762 was ambushed while on reconnaissance by the Van Duel RAF group. Black box data retrieved from the wreckage indicated the crew fought valiantly and were able to eliminate several enemy fighter bombers before suffering a crippling torpedo hit to the engine room that flooded the ship with radiation and left it unable to fight on. The surviving crew detonated improvised explosive devices than to allow a disabled spacecraft to fall into enemy hands. A second hammerhead was lost later that year in an accident. A commercial hauler servicing a combat group suffered a thruster malfunction and collided with the UES Tiburo PCG-3855 while undergoing refuel rearm operations. 
three were killed aboard the merchant transport, and a board of inquiry ultimately placed the blame on the Tiberos commanding officer for failing to recognize a supposedly audible proximity warning. The incident generated a long-term mistrust from the naval officers who believed the crew blameless and lead to the naval's request for major sensor changes to the Flight 2 model. The fall of the Messers in 2792 was devastating for Aegis Dynamics. Considered by many to have been the official ships of the Messers, they not only found themselves publicly disgraced, but many called for them to be charged for their role in the fascist regime's war crimes. Service History The new government sought to distance themselves from Aegis warships in an attempt to rebrand their military and sold contracts from other manufacturers like RSI and New Anvil Aerospace. Luckily for Aegis, the military had not negotiated an exclusive license on the Hammerhead design, which allowed them to adapt the spacecraft for civilian use in a variety of roles without government oversight in the attempt to remain solvent. Over the last 20 years, the Navy has slowly begun to regenerate the Hammerhead into service. Aegis' recent resurgence in popularity has allowed them to revisit the classic hull design and repurpose it for the modern age. No battle group leaves port without at least one Hammerhead included. They are frequently assigned to station keeping and long range patrol duties. The most significant engagement exclusively involving Hammerheads was fought in 2945, a full box of 16 hammerheads flying under a broad pennant encountered a small Vandal clan settling upon a squadron of hull ships. The ensuing battle defied tactical norms, with the group's admiral expertly keeping his ships in formation to train firepower on enemy destroyers. Three ships were lost and a fourth damaged beyond repair, but the group managed to rescue the endangered convoy and even destroy a far more powerful alien capital ship. On the civil side, bonded hammerheads are becoming an increasingly common sight, with many civilians using them as armored transports or outfit them for a variety of other purposes, ranging from low-level blockade ships to highly customized medical ships. Most such upgrades are one-off and done on the aftermarket. Aegis itself has stopped customizing hammerhead layouts for non-military customers. Perhaps the most famous civilian hammerhead is the Twilight Assessor, a Navy surplus flight IIA ship which was converted into a high-risk observation platform for tourists. Twilight Assessor retained her mil-spec shielding but converted all turrets into reinforced observation domes, allowing paying customers to experience of being up close and personal with the nebula, gas giants, solar flares and other dangerous stellar phenomena. The ship entered a Zetageist after her complement were found dead in space with absolutely no indication of a loss of oxygen or other damage. She has since returned to service. The Hammerhead remains in active production, with the latest models being as advanced as anything else in the modern UEE arsenal. The Navy has begun pairing Polaris and Hammerhead crews, with the two ships balancing their strengths against one another's weaknesses to form a fire team capable of both strong offense from the Polaris and a proper defense from the Hammerhead. Aegis has begun early jump tunnel development of the theoretical Flight 5. Though there are no naval contracts in place for this, it is unlikely to see service opening in the next decade. With almost two centuries of continuous development and improvement, there is no easy way for a single entry to recognize every single notable example. On the whole, Hammerhead-class ships have distinguished career, having completed thousands of successful operations and destroyed countless enemy spacecraft. We have chosen to highlight eight distinct Hammerheads across the design's history on the following pages to represent the ship's storied history. We feel it is important to note that this is by no means an exhaustive list. For a more thorough operation history of individual Hammerhead spacecraft, we recommend James Hasburn's Forge and Honor, the Hammerhead at War. For further details on the ship's technical development, spacecraft designer Cassie H. Larbig's memoir, Forging Ahead, is the essential reading. A note on spacecraft naming. The military chose to name initial wave of Hammerheads after sea life from around the Empire. The Flight 2 and Flight 2A examples were named after recently deceased senators. The Flight 3 ships, Mountains, and the Flight 4 ships, water-related deities. Hull numbers begin at PCG 3748 for the original UES 
hammerhead to tend to increase over time, but are generally not indicative of total number of hammerhead constructed. Historical numbers are occasionally repeated and occasionally blocks were left unused when ships had their construction contracts cancelled. The Naval's Office of Public Affairs can provide an unclassified registry of all UEE-issued hammerheads, produced and maintained records of all spacemen who served aboard them. Aegis Dynamics does not respond to outside inquiries about military design histories. Ship Histories UES Torsk PCG 3950 The last of the original hammerheads constructed. Torsk saw significant action during the Two Week War, an anti piracy operation in 2781, aimed at eliminating a number of known outlaw hideouts. Intended as a show of force to easily establish the Empire's dominance, the Torsk, which single handedly captured a transport laden with slaves, became the sole highlight of the mission. The UEES Pole Siege Wall, PCG 4101. The famous ghost ship, the Pole Siege Wall, was separated from her unit and supply chain in 2818 during a long range reconnaissance in what was then believed to be Vandal occupied space, suffering extensive damage to her navigation system and total jump drive. The crew of the Jewald spent 18 months disconnected from her fleet before a passing explorer managed to scope their short range beacon. The Gerald story was adapted into a propaganda video, The Iron Will, although historians quickly noted that the ship itself played by a surplus Guinea class patrol ship. UES Elizabeth Cowhiler, PCG 4170. The Elizabeth Cowhiler was a hammerhead assigned to screen to Desron. 33. Shortly into the Siege of Tiber, a surprise force of Vandal bombers attacked the squadron's flagship, the Veldor scored a crippling blow to her magazine. Kalheiler's captain, Commander Tyson Granding, took the ship's controls himself, maneuvering the patrol ship into enemy fire to save the crippled destroyer. The hammerhead prevented the destruction of the Veldor, but suffered a direct hit in the process and was lost with all hands. Granding was given a posthumous promotion to captain. UES Cheyenne Mountain, PCG 4550. Recent declassified documents revealed the post-build testbed for military sensor technologies to use for surveillance missions on the populace. Painted stealth grey and stripped of all weaponry, this hammerhead was believed to be capable of tracking inner system enemy fleet movements while hidden safely within the Oort cloud, given of a star system. The lack of stealth broadcasting technology prevented the experiment from being a success, as the ship needed to return to safe space before reporting to intelligence. Most active operations involving the Cheyenne Mountain remain classified. The UES Zayamontes PCG 4742. The Zayamontes was a long serving hammerhead assigned to the UES Third Fleet. During her 40 year service, the XM earned more individual battle stars than any other hammerhead in history, in addition to 27 other citations. At the time of retirement, her commanding officer, Commander Alex Tyrain, had begun his career as a gunner during the Zayam's very first assignment. Zayam Monti's painted mission board currently resides in the Imperial Aerospace Museum. UES Cabri Bald, PCG 4815. One of the few remaining Flight 3 Hammerheads still in service, the Cabri Bald is part of the United Empire of Earth's Ready Reserve, moored off MacArthur. While her engines are kept on power, she is as a reserve crew bring her and the rest of her squadron to full readiness in 12 hours in the event of major conflict. Caribald was last activated during the infamous Jenkelen incident in 2943 that briefly threatened to lead to a more involved conflict with the Zyan over the capture of a supposed spy. UES Nephili PCG 5555 Nicknamed 4-5 by her crews, Nephili is an active Flight 4 hammerhead currently on detail to the UEE Pathfinders for protection and scouting duties. Nephili is painted in the Pathfinders livery that holds the information record for farthest hammerhead from Ho. After a series of long-range jumps that took her exploratory squadron well beyond the boundaries of known space, Nephili is a combat veteran with over 80 confirmed Vandal kills and dozens of successful combat operations. The UEES Ennio, PCG 6109. 
The Enyo is an active duty hammerhead currently attached to the Home Squadron Mordant Earth, where it has been used to ferry diplomats to fleet functions and naval reviews. Enyo has a reinforced shielding, additional armor, and reworked interior custom designed to support such visitors. To date, she has borne the temporary Imperator One call signs four times. Externally, Enyo appears identical to any other service hammerhead. Ship scale. So, we can see how the ship stacks up in size compared to things like the Bengal all the way down to the Starfarer. So the hammerhead on this chart is listed as 150 meters long, it's 75 meters wide, and a height of only 16 meters. Its uh, weapons are all placed in um, ideal locations for defending itself and other vessels it should be escorting. It has three landing gear. Uh, it currently has two in the front and one in the rear. It has two entrance ramps, one cargo elevator, and one lift. Now, that's pretty interesting. I, I like to see how the, uh, the ship is going to look when it's landed actually in the game. I think it's going to look really cool, have a nice menacing stance to it. You can see the internal layout here. All the turrets are located, um, well, the main four turrets are located on the end of corridors. Um, you can see the docking collar in the nose, which is pretty handy for uh, shipboarding actions and things like that. I can see a ship like this being used to board larger capital ships and uh, stations as a landing craft because of how it's designed. All the turrets give it excellent coverage to get to its destination, and the docking collar enables it to attach directly to a space station or a larger capital ship. So as a boarding craft or a potential saboteur vehicle, it's... Um, yeah, it's ideal. Um, yeah, it's very, very cool. I do love the way the Hammerhead's layout works. It's very practical, it's well thought out, it all makes sense. Right, so now let's move on to the Q&A about the Hammerhead. So uh, get some of these questions answered and see more details about the ship. And then we'll move on to ship stats and things like that and a little bit of the theory craft. So let's jump right in. Are the ship computers powerful enough to run all turrets by AI blades? It depends on what other computer blades you want to equip, and whether you upgrade the computer items. But as it stands, the plan is that you won't be able to completely convert all turrets to be AI controlled, using the default loadout. We presently estimate that 4 out of the 6 can be converted to AI as standard, without any extra item tweaks, but this system is still to be implemented. Are the large power plants sufficient to run 24 times uh, size 4 laser cannons, or is the hammerhead designed to use ballistic weapons? Yes, the default power plants are able to handle the energy requirements of the default weapons. It comes equipped with a very efficient military-grade power plants for this purpose. However, running ballistic weapons does provide another avenue of pursuit in terms of maintaining fire output. What's with the big hole in the middle? Could it not have just been filled up with something like cargo or living quarters, or was it a design choice? It's a design choice, and there are practical reasons for it as well. In our shipyard posts on ship mass, we indicate how we derive ship masses from the geometry. The hammerhead is pretty fast for its size, since one of its duties is to help screen and protect larger ships from fighter attack. An increased internal volume, even from filling in the negative space, would add mass. In lore, the UEE has ordered a lot of hammerheads, thousands of them, for a combat dedicated role. Adding mass for off-mission amenities wasn't a demand, and efficient design by choice by the UEE military. How will the hammerhead's speed and maneuverability compare to similar ships like the Polaris? Their hammerhead is aimed to be more nimble than the Polaris, but with ships of its type, it's all relative. Ships of its size aren't dogfighters, they're mobile weapon systems. Their hammerhead excels at being a mobile defense ship and keeping steady, or at least providing smooth movement to help its turrets stay trained on their targets. Does modularity mean we'll be able to install a scanner, station, uh, extra fuel tank, computers, med bay? Is there something we can install into the gap in the middle? Please see above answer. The negative space is not a hard point, and plumbing or piping to it serve as one would impose an added cost of mass that doesn't serve the Hammerhead's military mission profile. The Hammerhead, though, provides an excellent defense for ships that you'd want to carry scanners, fuel, or medbays, 
and most would want the Hammerhead's existing computer and scanner's resources devoted to enhancing the performance of its weapons first and foremost. There seems to be some inconsistencies in the ship stats that have been given. Mass, length, manned, unmanned. Can you clarify these for us, please? The Hammerhead has six turrets, all manned. The confusion on the turrets came from a fairly last minute change to convert two of them to unmanned, to all of them being manned. Hence how there were combinations of six and six times two kicking around. Development is a very real time process, and here you get to see it, warts and all. We talk amongst ourselves and tweak the designs a lot even during the design process. Have you seen from our other features? A great deal of iteration occurs even in the concept phase and continues beyond. The mass value given was from the original design brief for the ship and wasn't updated in time for the release with the new calculations, as detailed in the recent shipyard posts. We will be updating the dimensions and mass values on the ship stats page soon, but as the ship is in active production it may change in the future. The turrets on the hammerhead look quite fragile. Will this be true in-game, making it its greatest strength, also its greatest weakness? To an extent, this is true. The Hammerhead's turrets are somewhat exposed. Of course, as you can see from the turret emplacement design, this exposure is also what gives the Hammerhead's weapons their excellent coverage and arcs of fire. It's trade-off. You'll see in many military weapon designs in history and in the real world, in everything from tanks to warships, Protected, hull down, heavily armored weapon batteries tend to have a limited arc of fire, slower traverse, and other aspects that make them more cumbersome or unwieldy than lighter, more exposed designs. The Hammerhead is a patrol and escort ship, tasked with screening larger ships from fighters and small attack craft, as well as providing patrol in force of primarily against non capital ships. When arrayed against its intended targets, being able to bring multiple targets to bear and overwhelm small targets with direct fire is a hammerhead's preference, especially when those smaller ships are not attacking the hammerhead. But the charge uh, the hammerhead has been tasked with is protecting. The hammerhead is a defender, but a very aggressive one that believes the best defense against small ships is a good offense. What does this mean for the attacker? You know the Hammerhead's turrets are a relative structural weak point and might provide an entry point for boarding if attacked specifically. It might be a weakness, but we'll leave it down to you to decide whether it's actually one that's easy to exploit. In the concept images with all the turrets firing forward, the rear turrets are nearly hitting the front turrets. Is the Hammerhead not intended to fire all turrets forward? What is the intended firing arcs and coverage? The Hammerhead is intended to hold a position with full 360 degree turret coverage on all angles, rather than be able to point them all in one direction. There are systems in place to prevent the turrets from hitting the ship, so whilst they can fire all forwards, it isn't an optimal solution. Recall that one of the Hammerhead's chief duties is protecting other ships from attack by fighters and small bombers. The Hammerhead is not a dogfighter, is too large and too heavily armed for that. It's designed to provide f not firepower in one direction, but flexible, massed firepower in any direction while adapting to the flow of combat threats around the ships it's escorting. And when it's not escorting anything, their Hammerhead is designed not to be safe to approach from almost any angle. It seems like there are a lot of quality of life features missing, like a kitchen, meeting area, mess hall, etc. Are there plans to introduce any of these? It is not particularly clearly shown on the cutaway image and fully built out for the concept images, but we have left space for a small living quarters area built around the bunk room exterior and in between the upper and lower turret entrance rooms. It's not the most luxurious ship, but then warships often aren't. The combat-focused mission on the Hammerhead, along with the size and performance considerations, also lead to the focus on combat features over comfort. That said, I am sure there are Hammerhead crews that look rather jealously upon the Polaris' pool table. The ship stats page that listed the missile launchers as being Marsden 683 racks. Does this mean you can also replace these with Marsden 616s or Marsden 625 racks in order to equip a small number of torpedoes instead? We aim to make them interchangeable. The blockout for them currently meets the metrics for allowing interchangeability. 
but things may change as the ship moves through the pipeline. For more information on torpedoes versus missiles, please check out the shipyard post which goes into detail on how the two types can be mixed together. Does the Hammerhead come with military spec components or civilian ones since it's a military ship being sold to civilians? It comes with military grade C item stock, although once these are worn out, people may find it more efficient to replace with other types of for durability given the expense slash rarity of replacing these. What is the ideal counter for a hammerhead in terms of rock, paper, scissors, and vice versa? What threat is the hammerhead an ideal counter? A dedicated anti-capital ship such as a retaliator would be able to fight their hammerhead effectively by tackling it from outside its effective range of its guns. Their hammerhead is intended to defend other ships from attack fighters with its many turrets, so mass waves of small ships stand little chance against it. Will the hammerhead be practical option for everyday gameplay? Can I hop in with a friend or two and an NPC crew and go hunting pirates to make a profit? Like all ships, it can be manned with a minimal crew, but the difficulty in doing this may outweigh the returns, depending highly on what missions you undertake. With the given example, it would be perfectly possible to achieve that scenario, but having a few more friends to help out would yield a more enjoyable experience. Can we expect any ramming ability? We don't condone this sort of behavior, but for some reason Aegis did provide extra internal reinforcements in the head of the ship. It seems to have a short range due to its size M quantum fuel tank in relation to its size L quantum drive. Can it be refueled in space by Starfarer? Of course it can be refueled in space by Starfarer. Interplay between ships is one of the key gameplay loops of Star Citizen. And whilst the L Quantum Drive can get you places, the slightly smaller fuel tank will require you to do a little bit more forward planning. Since we're talking specifically about Quantum Fuel Tank, in the UEE Navy fleet operations, it's contemplated that the Hammerhead usually sticks pretty close to the big ships it's protecting. So that's the Q&A over and done with, let's move on to the ship's stats and overview. So let's see what it's, the uh, quick brief here is. A fast patrol ship with multiple turrets designed to combat fighters, the Hammerhead is equally suited to support larger capital ships in fleet, or act as a flagship for fighter groups. So let's have a look at its old technical overview here. So avionics were, uh, and things like that, so let's have a look here. Radar, medium, computers, two medium systems, it has two large power plants, two large coolers, and two large shield generators. Propulsion, so we have two medium fuel intakes, two medium fuel tanks, large quantum drive, large jump module, medium quantum fuel tank. Thrusters, so we have four main large thrusters. Maneuvering thrusters, we have 14 maneuvering thrusters, that's, that's a fair few. Now turrets, as we all know the ship has six turrets, each one with four size four weapons on them. They're pretty nasty, but these turrets are all manned. The ship has around 32 size three missiles. So let's have a look now at its uh, stats. So its focus is heavy gunship, measurement is 115 meters, beam 75 meters, height 16 meters, size is large, mass is 4,260,000 kilograms. Cargo capacity of around 40, yet we do know it can hold a rover. Minimum crew of 3, maximum crew of 9. And that's all the stats that are currently given on this ship. So let's now discuss a few situations where a hammerhead would be absolutely lethal and what is where you would not want to take one. So this is a little bit of theory crafting here, so sit back, relax, and pop into your escape suit because we're about to get jettisoned. Alright, so the hammerhead is a very unique ship. It fills a role of heavy gunship. The only other gunship we know about right now is currently the Redeemer, which also doubles as a dropship. So this tells me hammerhead could also maybe double as a dropship. It can carry an Ursa rover. Now I don't see it needing to carry a rover necessarily for all of its missions, but Maybe as a dropship, let's say carrying a small team of guys just from the uh, orbit to the ground, is an ideal ship to do the task. It's got decent shielding, really tough armor, and like firepower that is almost unrivaled for a ship of its size and class. So, 
The hammerhead I see being is something that is quite versatile in most combat theaters, but this is one of its major drawbacks. In every other situation, the hammerhead also seems as a very um, cumbersome vehicle to take into uh, to do anything else with. You can't really use it for trading. Definitely not for something like piracy as the primary vehicle to carry the cargo because it doesn't have much space on board. Sure, it's got the firepower to dis disable the ship you're after, but then what are you going to do after that? It doesn't really have much in the way of storage space, so it seems like a kind of a waste in that regard. Um, it's not gonna double as a good bounty hunting craft unless you're planning on bringing back your bounty in an urn. So, <laughs> you know, it's not definitely not a salvage ship or a mining ship. It's definitely focused around combat. That's what it's built for. So you're saying, okay, fair enough, it's a combat ship, so what sort of combat scenarios do you think it'll be good at? Well, a CIG have stressed heavily that it's dedicated for anti-fighter and anti-heavy fighter and bomber kind of use. Now, Van Duel bombers aren't exactly the run-of-the-mill kind of bomber craft. You're actually talking about something slightly bigger than a retaliator. These Van Duel ships are no laughing matter, they're pretty tough. Right now, we've been encountering glaives and blades and scythes and all those sort of things and blades and they're they're not really tough these are very lightly armored ships they're not really armored at all the more heavier end of the vandal spectrum the ships actually start to get quite tough and this is what the hammerhead is designed to go up against so a super hornet is no problem for a hammerhead in the event of combat if a super hornet was to try to engage your hammerhead it doesn't matter how good the pilot is if the gunners are able to line up a few shots here and there, just a couple of hits and it's gone. The sheer volume of fire that a hammerhead can output also, when uh, when for when fighters get in an effective firing range, means that the the ships, these fighters, do not stand a chance. The hammerhead is a very very lethal ship to anything, including constellations. If you're an Akani, you don't stand much of a chance either. It's got just as enough missiles to knock you out at range if you do try to use the whole range game, and if you get into its weapon range of its primary weapons, like its turrets, you're gonna be going down in three seconds flat. Um, so, what? how would you really stop a hammerhead? The idea of stopping a hammerhead is you hit it at range with really big torpedoes and weapons, something to kill it to get uh, before it gets to you. It's the defensive ship, so... Retaliator Bomber, as I said, is a good example with his torpedoes. In general, just good uh, bombing craft, a squadron of vanguard uh, harbringers could do the trick. Then again, there's the other side of it. You need to get the drop on this thing. Luckily for you, the, uh, the hammerhead isn't exactly that great in terms of radar. It's actually quite blind when it comes to looking for its targets. It's only able to see things that are in its immediate range of its weapons and a little bit further beyond that. So getting the drop on a hammerhead is not its not a hard task. So, stealth ships. Stealth ships are how you take down a hammerhead. It's not necessarily easy uh, for the hammerhead to spot you if you um, didn't have stealth technology. But if you have stealth technolo uh, technology on board, you're going to be practically invisible. But the hammerhead does have a trick up its sleeve, which is its armor and its shielding. Now, its armor and its shielding aren't necessarily overly tough compared to things like a javelin or an idris at all. It's really tough compared to other ships of its similar size. I mean, a Genesis Starliner is nowhere near as strong as a hammerhead in terms of its toughness. And what I mean by this is the the hammerhead is armored. It's properly armored, like the Retaliator Bomber is fairly well armored. Now, scale that up a notch and, like, supersize it, and then you get the hammerhead. The hammerhead's missile payload is also something that's quite threatening. Um, 32 size 3 missiles are really vicious, um, especially for when you're fighting multiple hostiles. You just lock onto a couple here, fire a few missiles, lock onto a couple of targets there, fire a few missiles, and so on and so forth. And you can keep doing this for a while. Or, if you decided to really go for it against an enemy craft of something that would have to be a lot bigger than yourself if you're in a hammerhead, maybe something um, that has a capital shield generator, lock on and fire every missile you have at the same target, all the while firing off your turrets. Now... Firing your turrets. There's all another thing I want to discuss with the hammerhead quickly. 
Maneuvering the hammerhead is very important to getting the maximum number of guns to bear on a single target. You could decide to tilt the nose down so you'll be blinding the pilot and the co-pilot of seeing the target because of the way it's shaped, but if you do this whilst flying forwards in a um, kind of... Uh, you turn off your, uh, your main thrusters and you float towards the target, tilt the nose down with your maneuvering thrusters, then you'll bring five of those turrets which each contain four size 4 weapons to bear on a single individual target. Now that's a really a large amount of volume of fire. Now you want to amp it up a notch, I, I already know this since that's why you're here watching this video. So, <laughs> let's put ballistic cannons now on this ship. So we'll remove all the laser guns, we'll stick a crap ton of ballistic weapons on board, and now you have weapons that are four size 4 on each turret, ballistic, and you're bringing five of these turrets down to bear on an individual target, and you're ignoring their shields. So this is just hitting the hull of the ship. It doesn't matter what ship it is, it's going to start to feel it very quickly. One problem with this is now you're reducing your effective range. You have to get a little closer, and that now increases the dangers of you being shot back. Um, you can take a few hits here and there, but don't go trying to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with something like an Idris head-on. It ain't going to work you're too much of a flat target when you try to bring more. The more guns to bear you bring, the more of a target you are. And it's a fair trade-off. So the Hammerhead is excellent at destroying squadrons of fighters. Now, not many ships can boast that claim. Squadrons. Not just one or two, a full squadron of fighters. It's like five ships attacking you at the same time. Boom, 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 gone. You've just wiped them out and you can keep on trucking. That's a pretty powerful thing to have. So if you're in a mining organization, or you have a mining ship and you're looking to join an organization, or anything like that, make sure that they have a hammerhead that can protect you, because a few fighters here and there are handy if you want to protect something like a, um, a caterpillar or something, but if you want to protect something as big as an Orion, especially with this new size increase, you're going to need a hammerhead. You can't leave port without it as they said in its uh, lore post. It's one of those ships you need to bring with you. Same is true with the Javelin. The Javelin is an anti-capital ship, it's a destroyer, but that makes it incredibly vulnerable to things like um, bombers, like heavy bombers, like the Retaliator Bomber, the Vanguard Harbringer, and other ships like that. That's where you need hammerheads, not just one, multiple, because the the Javelin is such a large target, it's going to really need a lot of coverage. You're going to need at least one hammerhead uh, on either side of this thing, because its turrets are powerful on the Javelin, you've got great radar, but if those tar uh, those torpedoes get fired at you, they're going to focus on the center of mass, and you're such a large target, you're not going to be able to hit them in time. Especially with all the volumes of fire and missiles coming from elsewhere, most of your point defense systems are going to be over overloaded and overwhelmed. So you really need a hammerhead or two to really protect you and keep you safe. Same is true for an Orion or a whole E or something that is incredibly large. You need something like this with you or else you're going to have a really bad time. Now, hammerheads also double as really good outpost defense ships. And what I mean by this is their fuel tank isn't necessarily that great for traveling and stuff. So if you want to build a base on a planet, say you want to build a mining outpost, and we've already talked about this um, a little bit, but I'll be going into more detail about this later down the line with the Pioneer. But let's say you want to build a mining outpost on a planet's surface. You're really going to want something to protect that outpost. Sure, you can scramble a couple of fighters and um, try and fend off the target, but the chances are not all those fighters are coming home. If you send a hammerhead, or even have one sitting in the local vicinity of the same system even, just patrolling around, minding its own business, doing missions within the system, but then at least having it on call, so maybe you can call your buddy and say, hey bud, you know, my uh, mining outpost is under attack, just got the alert, could you go down there in the hammerhead? Fifteen minutes later, that hammerhead's gonna be there, and it will always come home. It will arrive, it will face down these cutlasses and caterpillars and who knows what else, kill it, and come home. It's just designed to do that kind of that kind of role. The Hammerhead is a warship. Now, it doesn't matter what kind of combat vessel you have, if it's as long if it's a repurposed combat vessel and combat wasn't its initial role, the Hammerhead will seek out that weak point in your armor and it will take you down. What you really want to do to take down something like a Hammerhead, a really efficient way of killing them is EMP. 
firing multiple EMP missiles, EMP bursts, all sorts of EMP technology will do the trick. And there's quite a few ships that have that ability, so you're in luck. Drake um, has an impressive lineup of ships, and they have all sorts of various good piracy ships, and you will most likely encounter a hammerhead if you're running piracy. How you're going to need to take down a hammerhead is you need to have something outfitted with EMP missiles and EMP equipment and maybe a few LiDAR missiles. And what those are is you'll fire them off and they'll give a false radar signature of a different ship. So if you, because of the Hammerhead's basic blindness in terms of its radar, you can really mess with it in terms of saying stuff's um, maybe trying to outflank it to the left and the Hammerhead will adjust to bring those targets down. But like as, it covered before, like as I covered before, the Hammerhead is designed to cover itself from every angle. Hitting it with EMP missiles will knock out some of the power to certain areas, maybe even the shields, and maneuvering capabilities, and some of the turrets. Thus giving you an entry point, you can blow one of the turrets off and then board the ship for yourself. So, ex exercise extreme caution when encountering a hammerhead in the wild. <laughs> Just like you would with a, a great white shark. <laughs> so yeah, be very careful with a hammerhead. If you're an owner of a hammerhead, I advise to you that you always run with the required amount of crew. Never run with a minimum, because you're going to be at a bit of a loss there. You do need an engineer, because the ship will have various malfunctions and problems, especially being a combat vessel in a combat environment. You need someone running repairs around that ship when you're really uh, getting into the middle of it. Because what use is a hammerhead if it has to bug out halfway through the fight? You need it to stick around. That's why you have one. So... Thank you for watching, guys. This has been another video. I hope you liked the extra bit of theory craft I added in there. I'm planning on doing this for the rest of the ships in the uh, ship video series I'm doing here, like, you know, where I'm covering all the ship stuff. If you like this little bit of extra theory craft, let me know in the comments. If you don't, I can always stop doing it. So, thank you guys so much for watching another video. It means a lot to me, you guys, coming back and subscribing. We're almost at 4K. I'm not sure if we can do it, but hell, let's, let's try. <laughs> and uh, keep on trucking. So, you know the drill commanders, fly safe, and I'll see you in the verse.